So Justin and I are here today to talk about studying abroad safely. Um, I'm going to be going through this presentation and Justin is able to answer any of your questions in chat and um, we'll go ahead and get started so I can introduce our alumni ambassadors that are with us today. So my name is Kelly Holland. I work with AIFS. I am the Vice President of University Relations, uh, which means I get to do a whole lot of awesome things, mainly with our US universities, but also universities overseas who are working with AIFS to do study, intern, or customized and faculty-led programs. I'll let Justin introduce himself. Hi everyone, I'm Justin Lee. I'm an admissions officer with AIFS Abroad. I've been working here since uh, 2007, working on various programs. Um, basically, I help students uh, after they're accepted with all the pre-departure uh, um, aspects of their program from visas to flights, to forms, to getting off the ground, um, as well as work closely with our resident directors once abroad to make sure that the semester uh, is a smooth semester for the students abroad. And we're super happy to have alumni ambassadors on this session with us. Right now we've got one logged on. Alina, I would love for you to introduce yourself. Let us and everybody know where you were and when you were there. Yeah, hi, um, my name's Alina. I am a sophomore at the University of California, Berkeley, and I studied abroad in Granada, Spain in fall of 2018. Perfect. And so full confession, Alina and I studied abroad in the same location. So if we take a Spain turn, then you'll know why <laughs> based on our own experiences. Okay. So what we wanna make sure we focus on for today's session, a few different things. We do wanna talk about staying healthy and safe abroad. Those are often seen together, typically on a website, health and safety. So we will touch on both of those things today. Um, a little bit more about our insurance benefits as well. So every um, intern or student who goes on our programs has some awesome insurance included in the program and we will touch on that. Also gonna talk about two of my favorite acronyms in this pandemic season, CFAR and IFAR. If you know what they are, good for you. If not, hold tight and I'll explain them shortly. The potential impact of COVID-19 on our programs. There are going to be some differences in on-location programs because of COVID and thinking about what that may mean for our participants is going to be part of this presentation. And all throughout, I'll be able to ask Alina some questions and have her think a little bit about her time in Granada um, and letting us know some of her own health and safety tips. So let's get started. So it's important to know that AIFS as an organization has a commitment to health and safety. If you think about the way the organization runs, we have many, many, many things that we're responsible for, but first and foremost is safety. So that's something that is a shared responsibility. You can imagine we have many different departments. You heard from Justin and I, we work in different areas of the organization, but thankfully get to work together as well. When we're talking about safety, we're talking about not only what we do on the university side of the house, or maybe how it affects a student's application or their ability to go or not go abroad. We're also working with our programs team, mostly based in London. I see Tracy on uh, today. Hi, Tracy. And so uh, the team in London is quite close to our programming. They in turn are working with resident directors, individuals who live in different locations to get feedback from on the ground. And of course, we're checking with a lot of different resources. Um, you can imagine the amount of things that we're looking at when it comes to um, making sure that we know we're making the right decisions in terms of safety. So active communication is a big piece of what we do at AIFS. That means when things are going on overseas, if we have students on the ground, um, for example, we do have students in Costa Rica this semester, and so keeping up with them, hearing back from the resident director, hearing updates on the programs from the students themselves, also speaking with our universities, parents and families, you can imagine that a lot of communication is involved in health and safety. And so especially now as we head into sending students abroad uh, in larger numbers, once again, we hope, um, starting with this summer, we have a lot more communication to be shared around and we're learning a lot as we go. You can imagine that local rules really come into play here because things look very different from place to place. So our students in Costa Rica may have one experience. If Alina were to return to Spain, which I'm sure she would love, she might also have a different experience. And here in the States, I'm based in Maryland. My experience may be different than what Justin is experiencing in Connecticut. So local is really important in this case, even though we're speaking about something global, 
um, very important to think about both local and global in this case. We also keep all of our information rooted strongly in facts and resources. So we're talking about science, <laughs> we're talking about Center for Disease Control, the State Department based here in the United States, um, embassies based abroad, the World Health Organization, lots of different really good information. Also thinking about local governments and ministries of health, many, many different resources in each location. So with AIFS, we work in many different cities and countries around the world. So you can imagine the level of information that we receive at all times, how to process that together and how to learn from it. So that's a little bit about our commitment to health and safety. So some health and safety tips. We've got a few of these. I'm sure some of these will be familiar to Alina as well. So um, on-site orientation is a big one. This is something where when you arrive in a location, you've probably got jet lag. And when you're thinking about how to get situated and how to get used to some different things, including your city, including your housing. Also, if you're interning, how to get to your host employer, um, different things like that. You wanna make sure that during orientation, which is typically held in person, um, one difference that may happen this year is orientations on location may be virtual. This depends on the quarantine situation in each of the countries. So that's something where you'll be getting that information up to date right up until you depart. So you'll know what to expect when you get there. Um, Alina, what do you remember about your on-site orientation? What were some of the things you were thinking about when you got to Granada that you were hoping to get answers to right away? Um, yeah, so when I studied abroad in Granada, I had just graduated high school, so it was part of a gap year. So this was really my first experience being alone and in a foreign country, um, sort of without my family. Um, and so I really appreciated just the number of resources that AIFS had available. Um, during the orientation, you meet all of the staff that is there. If you're living in a homestay, then you meet your uh, host family and sort of all of the other people that you can reach out to to sort of help you feel stay safe. Um, they throw a lot of information at you um, and a lot of resources at you, but it's really helpful and it really helped me just feel more settled and just know that there were people there that I could reach out to if I had any issues whatsoever. Awesome. You're right. It is totally kind of this influx of information right when you arrive and there's so much to soak in. Um, in your case, being in a location where another language is being spoken, also receiving all this info, getting used to everything in one spot. So it's good that a lot of this is also given um, digitally and also in hard copy. So one of the big things that happens right away is emergency contact numbers. So the most important person for you when you're on location is your resident director, who we know and love as your RD. And so that person definitely has contact info that you want to put into your phone ASAP. That way, if you've got any questions, um, you can either call or text them. A lot of our RDs also use things like WhatsApp, so then they only need a Wi-Fi connection. So that's really good to look into those apps as well. You also wanna make sure that you're sharing your contact information back home to your family and to your school if you've been asked to do so. And also if you're keeping a local phone number, which is a great idea for a longer term program, that you're sharing that with the RD and also your classmates. So a good idea to keep some of those on hand. Other emergency contact numbers you might see. Um, typically when you go to a location, you'll know the insurance phone number. That's an important one. You'll also get to know some of the more local ones like a doctor, potentially emergency room, others that you can just put in your phone to make sure that you've got them there just in case you need them. So some of these other tips have a lot to do with street smarts and things like that. And those are really important to think about when it comes to thinking about how to stay safe abroad. Some of them are going to be no brainers, but they are worth saying because when you arrive in a foreign city, your mind is blown. Even if you've traveled before, if you've not been there before and you're settling in as a visiting citizen to this location, there's a lot going on. So you don't know it as well as you know your own city or the town that you grew up in. So you wanna make sure that you're playing it cool. So that's what some of these are about. Making yourself very noticeable as a tourist may not be as hard as you think. <laughs> when you, um, in my example, as an American going abroad, I can remember preparing to study in Spain as well and hearing, don't wear sneakers. None of the Europeans wear sneakers. And I was like, what? But it's true that in the United States, for example, we wear a ton of athleisure. So we're in leggings and sneakers and things like that. 
and it's not as prominent in Europe. They are typically a little bit more dressed up than we are. But what being a tourist really means is walking around with your bag open, your AirPods in, your tablet hanging out of your bag, and just looking like you're there temporarily. Maybe you're on your phone looking at the map, right? Trying to figure out where you are. Um, whatever that may be, it really does draw attention. So if there are any individuals who may wish to prey on tourists, then that's one thing that you wanna steer away from. You can imagine that just like there are in the States, there can be issues where there might be pickpocketing or other scams that are going to be targeting tourists as well. So you want to really be aware of your surroundings and be careful with your stuff. So I know um, for myself, when I carry a bag and I'm abroad, um, I also like to make sure it's got a full zip. So in that case, then I can make sure that nobody can just dip in while I'm on the tube or something like that while I'm abroad. So being aware of your surroundings can also help out when you've got friends with you. So making sure that you're not out alone, um, going out in groups is something you will hear a lot when you are overseas on one of our programs. Typically these programs have a variety of students who are joining the same program. So um, I would say it's pretty easy to pick up a group of people that you might spend time with. Um, you're also gonna have the chance to meet local colleagues and friends, potentially hang out some more with your host family if you've chosen to do that for housing. And so lots of different ways that you can go out and be smart about it. Um, also thinking about what happens at the end of the night. So if you are heading out in Europe, they tend to go out quite late, may not eat dinner until 9 p.m. and they may stay out until two or three. When I think about that now, I don't think I could do that. But in terms of going out and enjoying the European nightlife, you also want to think about how you're going to get home. So plotting out the end of your evening and how you're getting back. In some countries, you'll be able to Uber just like you do in the States. Um, and it may also be that it's walkable, but you really want to think, do I want to walk at night? Is someone going to walk me all the way back? Who am I out with? And things like that. Alina, do you have any tips when it comes to kind of being aware of your surroundings or public transportation or any of those kind of experiences? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for me, like I spent my first week really trying to get to know Granada. So I would go out with a friend or two and we would just walk the city and we would sort of get lost and sort of try to find our way back home. And that was a great way to just feel secure in this new new space um, and to help me feel comfortable that, you know, if I'm out late at night that I will know how to get home. Um, and especially like in Granada, there are a lot of really tiny streets that sort of wind everywhere and it's really easy to get lost. So I really wanted to be like a champion of that area and like really know how to get around. Um, so I think that that's something that's really important to do. Um, I would also just say that, you know, sort of coming up with plans, you know, trying to look like you know where you're going, even if you don't. Um, just to try to not attract too much attention to yourself, because even if you think, oh, well, you know, I'm not wearing leggings, I'm just wearing jeans, people are pretty good, especially in these cities at picking out who the tourists are. Um, so you just sort of want to be prepared for everything and, and know how to get places so that if people come up to you and are trying to sell you things, or if there are pickpockets that you sort of know how to handle those situations. Great advice. It is such good advice to explore your city in broad daylight <laughs> and to kind of take note of where you're at and what, you know, streets are mapped out to be. Alina is so right. Granada is a, a city of many winding streets and you never quite know where you're going <laughs> until you get there. So a lot of these cities will be like that. And then you can add on top public transportation. So um, Granada in this case does not have um, a metro or a train system. Um, in other bigger cities, you certainly might see in London, they've got the tube. Um, so you'd be taking that back and forth, whether to class or to work, whatever the case may be. And so really thinking about knowing your stops on the tube line, for example, is really useful. Making sure that you know which one is home, which one is school. Um, if you are just a few away, can you walk? Lots of different ways you can think about how you spend your time both during the day and in the evening when you're abroad. So a few more tips. We sure do hope that you're traveling outside of your city as well. 
especially if you're there long term. Usually when students are taking on one of our programs, especially for the semester um, or at least several weeks, they of course want to travel. So one of the best things you can do is also let staff know when you're going somewhere overnight. It could be a really simple update to your RD or perhaps there's a process in place with your RD that you understand. It could be an email to describe where you're going, provide your itinerary, and that way they just know. So let's say for example, in previous years, one of the bigger issues most recently was an issue in Paris. And even if your home city is Madrid and you've gone away for the weekend to Paris, everybody in Madrid has got a number on their head, right? So when the RD says, where are my 30 or 60 or 90 students? And she knows that two or three or five of them are together in Paris, it's really important information because if something has occurred in Paris, She'll know that you're there and then we'll need to go from there. So it might sound silly, like you have to report to your mom or something like that to let folks know when you're traveling, but it's super useful to keep people posted, um, especially if you're departing the country, most definitely. AIFS on the whole does not really recommend third-party travel companies. There are so many of these abroad. Um, it really is the booming business. So if you do plan to use one, just do your research. The internet, thank goodness, is a wide world and you can find many things on there. Look for reviews, look for information on the type of program, look for what's included in that price that they'd like you to pay. Ask questions, ask your RD, hey, has anyone ever taken a program on, you know, with these guys? And chances are they'll have some great feedback. Many of our RDs have been um, in the area and in this role for many years. And so they'll know everyone out there who's running different travel programs and they can really recommend. Um, but please make sure that you check your resources and get some research done before you pay anyone for anything that is not AIFS while you're abroad. Alina, did you get the chance to travel from Granada while you were there? Yes, I did. I traveled mainly in Spain because I was really trying to work on my Spanish, um, but I did travel to a bunch of different cities, um, sometimes by myself. Um, and I would just say like, you know, do your research before you go because going to a new place is always different and it can always be a little bit discombobulating. Um, I would also say, um, you know, if, if something's a little bit more expensive, but it makes you feel safer, I would definitely do it. Um, I did a lot of hostels and sometimes I would just pay a little bit more to have like an all women's dorm as opposed to like a shared dorm. Um, so I, I would definitely, you know, plan out sort of what you want to do and, and pay a little bit extra if it makes you feel more comfortable and use your resident directors to help give you advice on all of those things. Um, they're really great resources and they really, they really helped me plan some amazing trips while I was in Spain. I would also uh, add on to that, that um, there are a lot of companies that do target students um, with deals that seem too good to be true. And uh, a lot of times they are. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, and again, as Kelly and Alina said, do your research, ask questions. That's right. Yeah, and it's wonderful to explain your or explore, excuse me, your own country too, Alina. So I'm glad you got around Spain because that's all those different corners are very different as well. So really great chance to go out and explore that. And finances are interesting when you think about health and safety, because sometimes you are really trying to watch your wallet. It's very easy to spend money when you're in a new place and you want to do all the things and you have a limited period of time. But when you are thinking about things like safety, staying in a hostel or a hotel or any kind of budget residence as an example, then do make sure that you research the different availability, what are the prices and things like that. That's great advice, Alina. Sometimes finances can kind of steer us toward a cheaper option, but maybe not the best. So good to keep your wits about you when you're doing that research too. So we did wanna make sure to make some comments on mental health as well. So when you're thinking about health and safety, a lot of people are typically thinking about like, well, how do I stay safe while I'm going out at night and returning home, right? That's typically the first one. And now of course we've got COVID-19 to worry about. So everyone is thinking about that as well. But mental health is so important when you're abroad. One of the reasons for that is because typically everyone hits what we call the W curve of being in a new culture. So when you first arrive, even though you may be jet lagged and a little bit tired, 
the first thing you do is you get so excited. You are in a new place. It is awesome. Everything is cool. This is the best thing you've ever done. New people, new places, new food, amazing, amazing. And what happens after that is you go down a little. And so that means that you've missed your friend's birthday. You're no longer at home. You really miss your sister. You're sleeping in a strange place. You really aren't sure about that one class. And you can see how what started as euphoria can really kind of trend downward. It's really important when you get into those types of situations that you know your resources. So again, in a lot of, in a lot of cases, you may have roommates. So that's a good first avenue to think about how to help yourself when you're in kind of a down scenario. You'll be starting courses or you'll also be starting an internship. So you've got great resources in your host employer, also in your colleagues as well. Your resident director's importance cannot be overstated. They are amazing humans who also um, have the benefit of going through a lot of different kinds of training that AIFS puts on so that we can make sure that they've got the most up-to-date resources possible. Again, they've worked in this industry for a long time. So they've got some really good information to share and experience in general. So if you are feeling just down or punky or just not feeling it, um, it's not super important that you snap out of it right away, but it is important that you reach out and speak to somebody. It's also really useful to remember that your RD is present, right? They're in the same city where you are. So you can go grab um, a coffee and sit with them and just chat if that feels better. So you may want to Skype home and talk to your folks, but sometimes that can make you feel worse. So one of the best suggestions that I like to give in terms of kind of mental health, taking care of yourself while you're abroad, is to consider maybe setting up a time to Skype or FaceTime home, maybe like once a week. And if you're like a lot of people and you speak to your family every day, because we've got our cell phones, that can be really hard to imagine. But you also really wanna be in the place where you are. If you've done all the hard work to get somewhere to study abroad, you really wanna dig in. And so even when it gets hard, maybe especially when it gets hard, it's a, a good idea to try to do what you can where you are. And then of course, send the emails, send the messages, schedule the time with mom and dad or brother, sister, whomever, and make sure that you connect with them as well. Hopefully by the time you connect, you're giving them updates about what you've been doing, you're feeling good about things, and you're looking forward to kind of what you're working on. But be honest with yourself about what you can and can't handle as well. Um, it's exhausting when you first get there and your body's trying to get used to where you are, the time and everything. It sounds a little bit exaggerated, but it's honestly true. You need to get used to a new eating schedule, sleeping schedule, and things like that. Maybe you didn't grow up in a city, but now you're studying abroad in one and you can't sleep at night because it's noisy. So there are all kinds of factors that play into wellness and into mental health. So if you're tired, maybe you can skip that class that day and make up the work at another time and just rest. So be good to yourself. And there's plenty of ways that you can that you can do that. So just make sure you reach out for your resources. COVID specific stuff, of course, has leached its way into our study abroad programs. And we're learning a lot about this um, in the US as well. So first and foremost, I think we are going to be wearing masks for a while. This is also a really personal choice. So if you are comfortable wearing a mask, wear a mask. Right now, the whole world has had this strange common experience. So that's not to say that if you leave the US, you shouldn't bring a mask with you or several really, um, because it's still going to be important for quite some time. So of course that may adjust while you're there, especially for our summer students who are probably there during an interesting season of seeing some changes in COVID practices, but social distancing will continue to be really important. So kind of setting those boundaries for yourself and thinking about what that means for you is a good thing to think about before you get there. And chances are in orientation, a lot of people are gonna have the same questions. So it will be a good chance to kind of get situated, figure out what the COVID protocols may be. Also being sensible about gatherings, just like we are here in the States. Um, even if you are desperate to get to a concert, be in a large group, um, think smart about gatherings and how big of a group you're with um, based on where things are by the time that you arrive abroad. Also know the travel rules because now it's um, increasingly more difficult to leave the country and enter another because of COVID protocol. 
So that short weekend into France may not be possible right now in this moment as of today at this time <laughs> because right now the protocol says that you may need to quarantine when you arrive you may need to quarantine longer than you thought your trip would be so do yourself a favor and research again you're going to hear the word research a lot today <laughs> and make sure that you check out the travel rules make sure that you know what it means to enter a location um, right now we're in a situation where they're talking about vaccine passports negative COVID tests, lots of different things. So as you prepare to go not only to your location, but consider going to others, make sure that you're really aware of what the rules are. So in some situations, uh, it may be that we need to do some emergency management. We hope that that is not true for anyone, but of course we need to train and prepare for in the event that this does happen. So one of the biggest benefits to studying abroad or interning abroad with AIFS is our 24 seven support. So there are staff, as I mentioned on location, there's our favorite RD again. And of course, we also have uh, insurance support. So our insurance company, which I'll talk about next is CISI. Um, and as I said, every um, student on our program is covered by this program. So um, I'll explain a little bit more of those benefits. But in terms of an emergency, essentially what we're going to see is a lot of different types of things. It could be something as big as last spring when we had to evacuate all of our students due to the pandemic breaking out. And in that case, you can imagine there was a lot going on <laughs> trying to bring home students from a variety of different locations, do it safely and do it quickly along with the rest of the world. <laughs> so that's an extreme example of an emergency. There may be something more personal. Let's say that you are out on an excursion on the weekend and you fall and you break your arm. Or let's say that you wake up and you know you've got strep throat or kind of a variety of different things. Maybe you get your bag stolen in a public area. Lots of different kinds of emergencies. And so you should know that AIFS staff, um, both abroad and at home in the US are trained on protocol for how to handle these situations. There will always be significant communication um, and in most cases, there will be a variety of resources that we're using in order to solve the issue, whatever it is. So the example down here under communication is key. Let's say, for example, that this is the broken arm. So the student ideally gets in contact with the resident director first. This is the person who can solve your problem the quickest. So even though the first thing you want to do when you break your arm is call your mom, actually, you should probably get in touch with your RD and then you should call your mom. <laughs> so your RD is the person that can start to activate that insurance policy, get your medical assistance underway, taking you to a hospital to get your arm set, um, going to a clinic, maybe it's not broken, whatever the case may be, um, making sure that you get looked at quickly. And so CISI as our insurance company can assist in terms of costs and finances when it comes to getting medical assistance abroad. The US team is always notified. Um, that means that the program manager is notified and also typically the university staff as well. So in the case of your privacy, it's really important to think about what information you want shared and with whom. There are some universities that ask AIFS to share all information of any incident with them. And there are others where students have indicated that maybe only one person back home can be given that information. So when you're filling that information out on your student portal, make sure you think about that in terms of your own privacy and what you're comfortable with us sharing or not sharing. So in terms of updating parents, that is something that AIFS can assist with, but ultimately students are in touch with their parents pretty quickly. So depending on what the situation is, we just wanna make sure that everybody's informed and on the same page. Some days you can imagine, let's say for example, that it's the broken arm. Turns out it is broken, you need a cast. So now you've got a cast and it's summer in Spain, which is gross, but that's fine. But maybe in a few weeks, you have to take the cast off. And so if that's the case, you take a follow-up appointment, your resident director helps with all of that stuff. So they can really make it easy for you to kind of handle that sort of thing. So the important thing to remember is whatever the emergency is on whatever end of the spectrum, and now we can say that with authority because we've experienced a lot, <laughs> is that the RD especially will always be there to help you and all of the communication going on um, 
on the program side of the house and the university side of the house will help you get what you need when you need it. So uh, CISI, so this is our insurance company. There are a boatload of different benefits and services which are all explained in the policy. So when you enroll in a program and you um, begin all of your pre-departure activities, you'll also be able to receive a copy of the policy so you can read all the fine-tuned detail in there. It's included in the student fee, so you don't have to pay extra to be insured. It happens automatically when you enroll in the program. This is kind of another interesting privacy piece, but I think this one is super important because you can let AIFS know of any of your health concerns before you leave. That also means that if you have anything that you'd like to disclose, we can also get you extra resources before you get there. So if there are things, we've listed a few here, could be anxiety, could be mobility, could be severe allergy, for example. Those are things that you disclose on the front end so that we can help you have a better experience when you arrive. And by letting us know, we would let you know, okay, do you mind if I share this with your resident director, for example, because then the RD can prepare for your arrival and have as much information as possible. So that if something should happen while you're there, they've already got that info. Severe allergies are a great example of this because if you need to travel with an EpiPen, for example, if something were to happen, again, while you were on an excursion, you're at the Cliffs of Moor, you get stung by a bee. So your RD would know this student carries an EpiPen and they maybe know how to administer it or you know how to administer it, whatever the case may be, is something you've already agreed on beforehand. So in the moment of the emergency, it can be handled safely and quickly. You do wanna make sure to bring enough medications with you for your entire trip. If you are taking some at home, you will want to take them while you're abroad. Um, being abroad is not the time to stop taking medications that you take on a daily basis. There is no deductible. So if you're familiar with insurance, you may be familiar with some plans where there is a deductible to meet. There is no deductible with CISI. There is limited coverage for pre-existing conditions. So again, in the policy, this is all explained and you can read this very carefully. We can go over it with you. Um, personal effects like electronics can also be covered. So again, if this is something that you're interested in doing, um, we can help with that. And so can CISI as well. They have so many apps now. Uh, there are lots of different really interesting check-in features as well. They are constantly improving their services, which is really cool for us. So they have lots of different um, information on their app, also on their website. They've also got some great resources where you can use anywhere in the world and make calls quickly and easily to things like our on-call service where you can get in touch with a nurse. Um, and this is kind of the complement to the resident director in terms of dealing with health and safety or dealing with an emergency. So really useful to have this kind of ready and at your disposal in case you need it. Alina, is there anything that you would add in terms of maybe thinking in like using the insurance, dealing with a thing, having to work with the RD? Um, I did not have any big sort of health things while I was studying abroad. However, I would say like, it's always good to just prepare, plan ahead. Um, I, whenever I travel, always take, you know, like a little thing of Advil and maybe some cold medicine, just because those types of medications can be really hard to get in other places and just to have it on hand in case you need it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would also say if you have any problems, talk to the residence director, talk to your homestay. If you're living in a homestay, they are there to help you. They will go with you to an appointment. They will translate for you if you're in a country where you don't speak the language. Um, so using those resources is really important. Yeah, good point about the translating. There's nothing quite like being in a medical situation and hearing Spanish and you think you know Spanish, but then you go to the doctor and you don't know Spanish at all. <laughs> so having an RD there or your host mom or whoever it may be to translate is huge in those situations. Great example. You're giving me flashbacks, Alina. <laughs> okay, so these are the acronyms that I promised to touch on earlier. CIFAR and IFAR. So these are important now in this pandemic season because these are things that will protect your financial investment. So they are types of insurance. So CFAR being canceled for any reason, IFAR being interrupt for any reason. So you can see the link at the bottom and you'll get these slides when this presentation is over. So uh, you'll be able to visit this link with no problem. CFAR and IFAR are different. So CFAR cancel for any reason 
protects you before a program begins. IFAR, interrupt for any reason, takes place after a program begins. So let's say, for example, students who are on our program in the spring where we brought students home and everyone was evacuating due to the pandemic coming on, they would have benefited from interrupt for any reason. So um, in the case of cancel for any reason, you've enrolled in the program, you're ready to go, and we're gonna use a broken arm again. Let's say that you break your arm. You can't go on the program because it's complicated, your cast is huge, you just don't feel like you can go. CFAR is a situation where if you're enrolled in that kind of coverage, that can help recoup some of the costs that would have been spent on the program. So one of the important things to know about this is there is a 21 day window. So after you have financially committed to the program, you have three weeks in which you can enroll in CFAR and IFAR. That's really important. Um, that's an insurance company thing. So you just wanna make sure that you understand what the rules are. I would say if you are still considering a program and you maybe haven't committed yet, especially financially, do this kind of research first, because what you wanna understand is how much of your program fee, your flight, things like that could be covered. So in the case of another issue where we've got a pandemic outbreak, you can't go to a certain country, you wanna make sure that you can kind of protect the fees that you have paid to potentially recoup as much as possible. So these are two different ways where you can do that. They are separate policies. There are some situations, um, there are some exceptions. For example, international students who are from outside the US cannot currently apply for CIFAR or IFAR. There are also some restrictions for residents of the state of New York. Um, the thing to do is to research. So you'll want to make sure um, that you use this website. This is just an example. This is the one from our insurance company, CISI. There are many others out there on the web. So again, research away. Um, when you're looking and say that you're comparing with a friend, you're both going to go abroad. If you're leaving from a different destination or going to a different destination, your costs will differ. It also has to do with how long you're there. So lots of different factors. Um, when this policy is made for you. So it is an individual policy. AIFS cannot enroll you in this. This is something you would need to choose for yourself. But it is a smart investment um, and something you should think about if you're going to be going on a program, especially within the next year or so, is my personal recommendation. So here it is, COVID-19, the thing that everybody has been dealing with for literally forever. So we wanted to go through potential impact of COVID-19 in a little bit, it's Western Europe, you can't go to Australia for a while. <laughs> um, thinking about how COVID might impact your study abroad or intern abroad experience, these are just some of the examples that we wanted to bring to your attention. So let's say, for example, housing is the first one. In some of our situations, um, we typically would have host families with AIFS programs. Now it's possible that we may be looking at residences or apartments. Student residences are a great example of a spot where you might see really great COVID protocol. So it is safer for us to enroll our students in that kind of housing, just so they can benefit from those really good health and safety protocols. Um, it may also be that instead of a double room where you have a roommate in the same space as you, we're now using singles. Single rooms are very common now um, as a result of COVID. So it's one way to think about how the housing may be affected. Classes. This is something that you will obviously experience uh, in the US as well. So it may already be happening depending on where you are. Um, social distancing takes effect in classes, of course. Masks, you can imagine. So it may be that instead of a large lecture, you are in a smaller class. So it's possible that different universities may offer different sections of a course to try to mitigate how many people are in the room at the same time. Um, maybe some of the bigger lectures will be given virtually. So lots of different ways to think about this critically. Um, if you're currently enrolled at an institution in the US, you know that some of these things are already being considered. So it's really interesting to think about how it might impact how you're learning, where you're learning. Um, the locations of the classes may change depending on where they're being offered. 
So just a few ways that it can affect your classes as well. One thing that you should know is that AIFS is committed to academic continuation, which means that in the event that you had to come home, your trip is interrupted, um, or heaven forbid, we have another COVID outbreak, for example, we will continue your academics. So we'll make sure that the credit is possible for you at the end of the program. And we'll make sure that we can um, work with the professors directly in the university to make sure that you've got the work that you need to do that. So no worries about that part. Um, internships. In the case of internships, it's possible that while you're abroad, um, your host employer may also have some different COVID protocols in place. Again, masks, social distancing, that sort of thing. But it is possible that depending on the size of the organization and the gathering rules in that locality, they may need to say only this many people can be in the office at this time. So let's say for example, that Tuesdays and Thursdays, you only work in the afternoon, but you can log on at home in the morning. And so work a little bit virtually, work a little bit in person. So we're seeing some interesting hybrid schedules and things like that, depending on what the employers need and want for the safety of their employees, including their interns. And of course we have virtual internships, which are quite popular right now, you can imagine, because a lot of folks aren't leaving the country. So um, that is another option as well. If you decide to stay in the States, virtual internships are also a possibility. When it comes to social events, these of course will look a little bit different than they would previously. So the same things apply, masks, social distancing. It's possible that in some locations, if we're unable to go to certain spots, um, we may be looking at different experiences where you could maybe go on your own, um, looking at more outdoor activities as an example to try to help mitigate any kind of COVID exposure indoors. Um, depending on the location, some things we may have typically done might be closed because they aren't, don't have good COVID protocols in place. But a lot of this is changing literally every day. So from week to week, um, new things become available. I think uh, different tourist attractions are probably making a lot of hard decisions in terms of how to welcome students, how to keep things safe. Um, if you are exploring in different areas and there's always a really long line at the Louvre or in Vatican City, uh, you wanna make sure that you know what the protocol is at that place before you arrive. So the same thing is true when you're traveling to different countries or cities. Also think about the places where you might be going on your own and know that any of the social events or cultural activities that AIFS has put on, we've done that research for you. So we'll be able to tell you what different kinds of things are in place at these different social events. So social events are still in the calendar. They haven't been kicked off <laughs> and we're hoping for the best in terms of what we can offer in the future terms. Excursions, one of the biggest changes here is that they are typically in country. So on some AIFS programs, you may have seen in previous itineraries that you could be going to a different country. For example, if you're in Spain, you might go into Morocco or you might go over to Portugal. Um, right now, due to COVID restrictions, excursions are staying in country. So for example, our Costa Rica students that are based in San Jose uh, are not going into any of the neighboring countries. They've been exploring Costa Rica and different areas there. So that's one solution. So still having excursions, just not crossing any borders for some of those reasons that I mentioned earlier. Alina, can you envision any kind of other spaces where you think COVID might really make an impact when you're abroad? Um, I mean, I think that COVID has just made everything a little bit more difficult. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think with COVID, I think traveling is going to be really different for, for a while and that it's going to impact pretty much everything that we're able to do. Um, I know, especially with like social events and excursions where, you know, you're going into places or you're in new spaces, um, that can be a lot harder with COVID. Um, but hopefully, you know, it'll work out. <laughs> I'm hoping to study abroad again and I, I'm hoping that things will be more open in the future. Um, but it's just, I think, just being careful and following sort of the protocols that we have here is always a, a good rule of thumb. Yeah, it's a good point. This is something that's gonna affect us for a long time to come. So research, preparedness, all of those things, it makes everything take a little bit longer, but it will be worth it by the time that we're able to do these things and do them safely. So I think we'll see a lot of changes to travel and, and then we'll be continually updating what we offer as well to make 
sure that we're keeping up to date with all those health and safety ideas. So this is my last slide, I believe. So we wanted to make sure you had time for questions. So Alina is of course here as an alum to answer any questions that you may have about general health and safety. I can also answer any questions as it relates to COVID or any of those acronyms that you saw earlier. You can feel free to type them in the chat or you can also just unmute yourself and ask if you'd like. Is it more common for people to join a program with a friend of theirs or just like on their own? Good question, Mindy, thank you. So uh, the question there being if it's more common to join with a friend or to join on your own. I think we've seen a bit of both. Um, I, for example, joined by myself. Alina, did you join by yourself or with a friend? I joined by myself as well. Yeah, Must I be a Granada thing. By <laughs> as well. Yeah, you did too? Yes. So I think it really depends. Um, sometimes it also depends on the type of program. So with AIFS, you've got a lot of different ranges of programs. So if you did something that your school organizes, customized and faculty led, it might be smaller with a professor from a university and going to one location for a shorter amount of time, maybe two, three, four weeks. Um, if you're going for a semester and a little bit longer, then sometimes we do see students who come from the same university who go together. Um, on my program, I can remember uh, University of Texas had a huge contingent and they were they came together and they stayed together the whole time. Um, so it's also kind of that sort of thinking about experience. If you would like the comfort of being with someone you know, um, making sure that when you're there, you don't always stick together and create that bubble. You want to make sure you get out and meet other folks as well. But it is really cool to come through the process with a friend so you can do it together and then also have an awesome experience abroad. So I think it's a mix. I have questions. more questions, but I don't want to like talk over other people if they have them. Um, <laughs> uh, so what are the weekends like for most of the programs? Are they like always like three day weekends, four day school week? Are there like week long breaks where I could use that to travel to another country? Um, or is it mostly just like regular five day school, two day weekend? Good question. So we probably have a few examples here. Alina, what was your schedule like in Granada? Um, yeah, so my schedule was um, a Monday through Thursday. So I usually had a three day weekend. Um, I would also just say classes are very different over there, especially as an international student, like sort of going abroad. Um, the professors there really know that you're there to have an experience of studying abroad that you're there to travel. Um, so most of my professors, if I needed to miss a day or two because I was traveling somewhere, it was not a big issue at all. Um, and the classes are generally like take you out into the city. So, so they're using the city that you're living in as a classroom to sort of teach you. Um, so I would say, you know, it's generally pretty easy to make whatever travel plans you have work. And the weekends are generally free for you to do sort of what you want and explore the different things that you want to explore. Justin, would you add anything about what you've seen for schedules or excursions? Yeah, um, I would definitely say that um, it is very program dependent. Um, and even sometimes, uh, you know, specific time within the, uh, uh, the specific program. For instance, um, if you're looking at Granada, let's say, um, and you are doing the Early Start program, uh, which is an intensive uh, three to four week course, that course could meet, you know, five days a week for those, uh, you know, three to four weeks. Um, and then during the semester, it could go, you know, Monday through Thursday. Um, another example is Costa Rica, where there are, you know, intensive courses as well. Places where you have a direct enroll, um, like, uh, let's say uh, the American um, Business School in Paris or um, uh, the um, American College of Greece. You're looking at a direct enroll and uh, you're probably looking at classes five days a week, although you do have some control over your schedule. So it, it very much is program dependent. You may also see some schools that use a spring break, just like traditionally a U.S. university would, so that's where your week is. 
Um, a good example would be in a lot of the Catholic countries, Semana Santa, which is Holy Week. And so typically April or so, depending on where Easter falls, uh, you may have a whole week dedicated to that, um, which you can use for travel. Or if you're interested, you can stay in the country. There are some really interesting celebrations that happen during that time. Um, but it will totally depend. They're both right. <laughs> so the thing to do is kind of research that location. And then on each of our pages, you'll also see an itinerary. So then you'll have a good idea. The excursions that AIFS puts on are, could be a weeknight. You know, you could go see flamenco in the evening, uh, for example, or you could go to the Cliffs of Moor on the weekend. And so excursions like those, if you're based um, in Ireland, you might go to the Cliffs of Moor. Something like that is typically included in the program. AIFS programs also have optional excursions. And so typically those are longer, maybe overnight. So again, if you're based in Spain, head to Portugal. Um, if you're based in Hungary, go to Austria, things like that. So um, just keep an eye out for what's included and then also what's optional. The website has a lot of good details as far as excursions go. That was another one of my questions. I know you mentioned that a lot of the excursions are trying to stay in country. And I was wondering if it's gonna be like that for fall semester. I would guess so, yes. Again, this is today at this time because everything has been consistently changing. So I know for our summer students, they will need to stay in country and they're given locations. Um, but in the fall, maybe we'll see some flexibility there. So that's to say that our excursions will stay in country. I would guess that the resident director and our staff in general would recommend that you do the same. Um, independent travel has always been possible. So it's something where they might say, if you plan to go outside the country, you absolutely have to report it. Um, you have to give us your information and then we have to confirm with you what the COVID protocols may be. So in the fall, I'm hoping we get away from some of the quarantine stuff, but right now a lot of locations when you arrive, they still ask you to quarantine for anywhere from five to 10 to 14 days. So I'm hoping that will change, <laughs> but that's a moving target. So keep an eye on that one. Um, and then Justin kind of mentioned this, but I noticed some of the programs are like September intensive month and then like a regular semester. What's the difference between the intensive month and like the rest of the semester? Sure. So typically um, we'll use Spain as an example again. Um, I think, I don't know if Alina did this. I know I did. I went in January for an intensive month because I was working on Spanish. So I arrived, I took a placement test and I was placed into a level. And then that month, those four weeks, as Justin said, I was in class for five days. Uh, each week, it was a lot. Then there was a break in between. Um, that's not part of the full program. So that's an intensive start that you can choose. And then from the break, then other people may join for the semester as well. So the ones that I'm familiar with are foreign language based. So you would be focusing on that before you started, kind of gives you a head start, helps you get into the country as well. And then in the semester, you branch out to the schedule that Alina was describing. So then you're picking courses, um, you know, looking at like Spanish for business and culture and save, those sorts of things, and taking those throughout the week, just like you would at a US university with different professors, and then typically Monday through Thursday. Justin, would you add anything else, maybe other locations? Um. Yeah, definitely. Uh, places like France and Costa Rica also have early start options. Um, I think those are probably the ones that I can think of right now. Um, as an admissions officer, one thing I, I have noticed is that um, students like the early start, it kind of, especially when they're not too sure in their language ability. It, um, as Kelly said, it kind of gives them a kickstart um, and confidence to, to really, um, you know, live in the city where they're going to be, uh, you know, where, where you will be studying. Um, completely optional and students do both, but I have, I have uh, heard a lot of students uh, really thrive with that early start program. Alina, I saw you smile. Did you do it as well? Yes, I did. And I would just say, like, if you're able to make that work, I would highly recommend doing it. 
Um, it is a great way to just sort of get settled because everything is changing so fast. And then to be jumping straight into your regular semester is really hard. Um, so taking that month to sort of figure out where everything is, get used to speaking a new language. Um, for me, it was really helpful and it really helped me sort of meet people and get to know people. Another big um, advantage to doing that is, especially if your university has requirements that you need to take a certain level of Spanish in order or whatever language to get credit, that first month gives you a chance to bump up the level that you'll be taking your regular classes in if you don't meet that requirement right away. Um, so I know a lot of my classmates didn't quite reach the level that they had expected and after that first month of, you know, four to five hours a day of Spanish, um, they were able to test in really easily to what they needed. Um, so that's an advantage as well to doing the program. Yeah, good point. Keep them coming, Mindy. I've only got a couple more. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that because of COVID protocols, we might get placed in like a single room instead of a shared room or something like that. Uh, if that happens, are we paying like the single room fee? Because I noticed online it says like if you want a single room instead, you have to pay like an additional fee. Good eye. You've been doing your research. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> so for sure, typically back in the day, a single room carried a supplement. But now with COVID, single rooms are becoming the norm. So at the moment, um, I know at least for summer programs, I do not believe there's a supplemental fee. But if after this webinar, if you've got a specific location question and you'd like us to check, um, you can just email us back when we send you the email and then we can let you know and confirm what the situation is in your location. Okay. Um, and then how does applying for scholarships work through AIFS? Am I like auto submitted when I fill out like a program application or is it like a separate application on its own? Justin, go ahead. All right. <laughs> um, so uh, right now, Mindy, uh, the scholarship applications are uh, PDF um, applications. And basically what you would do is you would fill that out, attach the essay and uh, whatever, whatever other uh, requirements, depending on the application, there could be uh, you know, financial requirements um, or whatnot uh, to attach. And then uh, right now you can just email it to your admissions officer or um, your enrollment manager, depending on who you are working with at the time. And then we'll get it entered in for you um, and confirm uh, once we receive that. Since those are due April 15th, should I get started on that like right away? Is that gonna take like a full 15 days? <laughs> Um, it probably won't. I mean, it certainly won't hurt okay. to start on that right away. Um, uh, the essay uh, is about a thousand word essay. Um, and again, depending on the, uh, um, you know, the scholarship, there could be some other uh, documents that you have to attach. So I would definitely start looking into which ones you're going to apply for thinking about that essay. Um, and even, you know, starting to draft the essay, um, uh, you know, now, sooner rather than later, for sure. Where can I find the information about, like, the essay and all those other things? Sure. Um, I will throw the link um, to our scholarships in the chat. And basically, the requirements are on each of the PDF, or actually, there's only one PDF application now. But the requirements um, for each application, uh, each scholarship uh, is in that PDF. Um, so you can take a look at it there. I will do that right now. Thank you. Absolutely. That's actually all of my questions, by the way. Yeah. I'm done now. <laughs> Good. I'm glad we got to see them all. Those are great. You covered a lot. <laughs> All right. We are just about at time. Any last minute questions before we let you go? I just threw the uh, scholarship link okay. um, in the chat there, Mindy, and anybody else who's interested. And certainly, if you have Great. any questions, you, um, feel free to uh, to reach out to us. Uh, we're more than happy to uh, to answer any questions you have about scholarships. 
Thank you everyone for joining us and big thanks to Alina for hanging out today. Thank you for bringing that alumni perspective. We appreciate it. And if you uh, have registered for this webinar, you'll get these slides and all that information will come to you. And as Justin said, you'll have an email address so you can also respond with any more questions. Um, otherwise, that is it for us. So thanks very much and have a good day, evening, wherever you may be. All right. Thank you, everybody, Take for care. attending. And thanks again, Alina, for yeah, showing thank up. You.